Go ahead and get started since it's 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central Time. Welcome everybody and to the Tennis One app. This is Crowdview Live, a very unique and interactive broadcast feature. This is the five episode Crowdview Live series, Road to Champagne. We're super excited. And if you didn't know, we are excited to announce that Tennis One app will be the exclusive app and streaming partner for the men's and women's NCAA Division I championships. We couldn't be more excited. We're so excited to be a part of it and to have this series here in Tennis One. So I would like to welcome in our college tennis insider, Mark Bay, a Midwest USPTA Hall of Fame inductee, eight-time coach of the year. He has coached 17 NCAA individual championship participants, including NCAA champions, Alexis Prusis and Brianne Miner. And on the broadcast side, he has been an analyst for college tennis since 2014, including last year's NCAA championships. Mark, we couldn't be more happy to have you here in Tennis One. Thanks so much for joining us in Road to Champagne. Madison, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed the coverage last year. I was, even though I was working for Tennis Channel covering, I was still watching Tennis One app as well and keeping up with the coverage both ways. It's a wonderful app. It's an outstanding way to bring the coverage this year at Champagne, which is obviously a stone's throw for me. I'm excited to be down there and be involved as much as possible. And this series of shows hopefully can shine some light and bring some more excitement to this year's championships. Absolutely, Mark. You mentioned it. We hope to just bring as much coverage and shine as much light as we can to this special sport, especially on both the men's and women's side. We'll be covering it all here in Tennis One. So I would like to welcome our special guest. But before we do that, I want to take a look back at a very special moment that our guest was a part of last year. Shelton, the son of Brian Shelton. You could, you could not, not write, write a script, script any, any better. better. Ben, ben Shelton, Shelton the, son the son of Brian, of Brian Shelton, Shelton, has just has given just his given dad, his dad in his Florida program, his Florida program their, first their first national, national championship. championship. Uh, obviously, an incredibly special moment for you, and, and we would like to welcome to the show head, University of Florida men's tennis coach, Brian Shelton, a familiar face to the Tennis One app and the collegiate tennis community. He led the University of Florida men's tennis team to their national championship last year, along with his player, Sam Riffis, taking home the men's singles championship. Welcome into Tennis One, Coach. We are so excited to have you. Madison, thank you. Uh, man, thank you for taking me down memory lane last year and uh, replaying that, uh, that amazing experience that we were able to share uh, our team and our program with so many of our fans out there. And you guys did such a great job of just covering us through the Tennis One app. And, you know, I'm excited for what you guys bring to the table and for what we're going to continue to do this year. Uh, in Champaign. Um, it's really exciting that uh, we can showcase college tennis in a really positive way and that so many people uh, who aren't able to be there in person can actually be there with us and watch what's going on. So thank you. Thanks for having me on today. It's always good to be with Coach Bay. He's a legend. You're right. And, uh, you know, he's, he's one of those pioneers in our game. And so any chance I have to be around him and, and uh, be a part of what he's doing, I'm always excited. Well, thank you so much, Coach, and thank you for all the nice things you just had to say about the Tennis One app. So I just wanted to do a quick little take down memory lane again. You and Mark, obviously very close, both involved last year. Uh, Mark, do you just want to speak a little bit to this moment right here? That was an outstanding moment. Wonderful picture. Had great times with Ben all throughout the tournament with his pump up music and getting himself going. and. Couldn't be happier. Obviously, you watched him as a little tyke walking around at Georgia Tech when the coach was just starting and getting the job done there on the women's side when he was a little you know, knee high to a tadpole and to see him actually close the door and get it done, not just for the Gators, but also for his dad was an amazing moment. And Mark, you just touched on it a little. 
Coach, you have also coached the women's side of things in that of Georgia Tech, taking them to a national championship as well. So we just wanted to kind of get your insight and you to talk a little bit about the differences and similarities in men's and women's tennis. Well, you know, that's a question that I've been asked a number of times. And, you know, people always ask me, which did you prefer? Which do you prefer, coaching the women or coaching the men? And it's just a question I can't answer, you know. Uh, I had great experience at Georgia Tech working with the young women that I was able to work with through my, you know, uh, over 12 years, uh, almost 13 years there at Georgia Tech. And, you know, and then I've had a great run here at Florida for the last 10 years. And, you know, to be in this position, to be able to do both, most coaches don't have that opportunity, but I've been very blessed to be able to do both uh, in, in one lifetime. And, um you know, the differences, I mean, they're, they're subtle. You know, I, I felt like our time at Georgia Tech, we always said that you girls are athletes. You know, you're not just tennis players, but you're athletes, and I'm going to treat you like athletes. We're going to compete and practice every single day, whether it's playing specific games or playing sets or things like that. We're going to really push you to be all that you can be, and we're not going to put any limitations on what you guys can do and what you can accomplish and really just try to empower them to understand their unlimited potential. And I'm doing the same thing with the guys. Uh, I'd say one of the differences is that with the guys, I've got to be a little bit firmer and a little bit more direct. And if you're married or <laughs> you have a boyfriend or you, you know, we guys, we, we sometimes need to be hit over the head a little bit before we start listening. Uh, girls are a little bit more in tune. Uh, hear everything that you're saying, see all the subtle signs. So you had to be careful about what you would say to them because they were going to take it to heart where the guys, you have to sometimes be a little bit more forceful. So I'd say that's probably the biggest difference, um, but certainly enjoying my time now at Florida as I did at, at Georgia Tech. We love that. And we love all of the success you've had on both the men's and women's side. And it's so fun to hear your insights. So I'm going to let Mark take it from here. He'll get into the nitty gritty with you for your Florida men's team. Thanks, Madison. So Coach Brian, I'm, so I'm going to start with my junior tennis hat on. To get ready for nationals, old school, you would go through your sectional competition to get you tougher to get to nationals. And Conference play for college teams sort of functions just like that sectional to national jump in juniors. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of the conference play and how maybe last year's beat, uh, beating from, from Tennessee maybe set the tone and got you ready to win a national title. How are these conference matches giving you that toughness to go on and win titles? Yeah, I think number one, we're fortunate. I said it. Uh... In, our, in the awards ceremony after we won the, the title over Baylor last year, I said that we're, we're blessed to be in the Southeastern Conference. I mean, I don't shy away from that. Um, we've got so many teams year in and year out that are ranked in the top 10, ranked in the top 20, ranked in the top 40. And so when we go through our regular season schedule, we've got 12 quality matches at the end of the non-conference segment. So to be able to play national indoors, learn some things, lose a match or two, uh, learn from those experiences, and then get into our conference schedule where we're playing, you know, arguably some of the best teams in the country. And we're playing mostly outdoors, which is so nice in our conference that we can play outside, of, which is where the NCAA tournament will be outside mostly. Um, so there's some built-in advantages that we have. And, you know, going through the gauntlet of the SEC, I mean, you're going to be pushed every single weekend. We play Friday nights, we play Sunday afternoons, and then you turn around and you do it again the next week. So, you know, six or seven weeks of that prepares you. And then you throw the conference tournament on top of that, which we're about to get into here uh, in Athens this week. Um, you know, last year we lost in the, in the finals of the conference tournament to Tennessee after beating them in the regular season. And if you want to think about, like, what needed to happen to put us in a position to win it all, I think that's what exactly needed to happen. We needed to lose a tough, gritty match against a very, very tested and strong team in Tennessee. And that really ignited a fire underneath us for those next 
couple of weeks in preparation for the NCAA tournament and then to help us get through it to understand we didn't like that taste in our mouth losing that match and we needed to do everything and everybody needed to, to be on board completely. And we got everybody's attention after that and you know the rest is history. Outstanding. So comparing last year's team at this moment to this year's team at present moment, what do you think? Well, there's, there's a lot of similarities. I mean, uh, a lot of the names are the same. You know, we don't have a lot of new names uh, to add to, to the list of characters that we played last year. Um, there, some of them are playing different positions. Um, we've got one guy in particular who was playing number five for us most of the year last year, who's now playing number one. His name is Ben Shelton, and uh, he's had a heck of a year so far. Uh, played really well in the fall, and he's continued that through the spring. Uh, Sam Riffis, who had some injuries right after the U.S. Open, actually during the U.S. Open against Dimitrov, he, he actually fractured his back. And so he was out for most of the fall, and he's back now, and he's 100%. Didn't start the season, you know, in top form, but he has now rounded into top form. So... The top of our lineup is super, super good right now. Uh, the middle of our line, lineup is strong. Um, and we're just uh, starting to figure out things in the, on the back end of our lineup. And uh, this year, different than last year, I think we've won maybe 14 or 15 doubles points in a row right now. So I don't want to jinx us, <laughs> you know, because that doubles point is, is uh, it's tricky. Six games set, no ad. Um, Everybody who plays tennis knows that when you play no ad scoring, things can happen. And uh, we've, we've been doing some good things, though, with our doubles. And last year, it, we were, it was a liability for us, honestly. We lost more doubles points towards the end of the season than we won. And we were just doing it with great singles play and just guys that compete. Um, this year, we still have that competitive edge, but our doubles is better. So I think that's something that we can rely on now a little bit more. So with that those lineup scenarios and all those mouths to feed. You did mention the national indoors. It was a little tough because you thought you had three different guys that could maybe play the bottom position. Have you gotten to the point where you're still sorting? Are you actually going to experiment even in the conference tournament as such to find the right magic, you know, combinations, or will you just go match up based on the team and who's playing those positions, just pull out the gun that you think can get it done for the Gators? That's a great question, Mark. You know, I don't want to give that informa information out to the world just yet, but uh, we're pretty solid with what we've got. Uh, there may be a wrinkle, maybe one wrinkle still left, uh, one card that we still have left to play, um, but I'm not going to divulge that right now, but uh, you, you just got to stay tuned. Uh, our doubles is, is solid. You know, I feel like we, we've got it right where we want it. Uh, and then you know, most of our pieces are in place in singles, but we might, might, just might have one little wrinkle. Interesting. So if you had to use one word right now, only one word to describe the mood of the team right now, the mental place that the Gators are in right now, if you had to use one word to describe it, what would be the mood of the Florida men's Gators here getting ready to take on the conference competition? Hungry. 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 These guys are hungry, man. I'm not kidding. They're hungry. I mean, we went 12-0 and in the conference this year. Uh, it's our third year in a row that we've gone 12-0 and through the SEC regular season. Uh, and you would think that, you know, their bellies would be full. But these guys, they want more, man. It's, it's incredible. This, this senior class that we celebrated last weekend uh, with Duarte Valle and Sam Riffis and uh, Josh Guger, Andy Andrade, and Matias Simar. I mean, it's, it's got to be up there, the, one of the best senior classes I've ever heard of or seen or been a part of. Because what these guys have done for the Gators in their time in Gainesville uh, is just remarkable. I mean, think about it. 12-0 and 0 in our league three years in a row. I mean, that, that says it all. It does. So – Getting ready for something like this, you're at the tail end of the season. You know what it takes to win a title and to have an individual win a title. So from, again, the coaching people out here who really love to get into what happens at practice every day, 
have you tapered off the practice volume? Are you doing less? Are you doing more individuals? Are you playing some sets? Like what does practice look like as you're getting down the home stretch with something like this? Yeah, well, it's, it hasn't, we haven't backed off a little at, at all. If, if anything, we're, we're, you know, now that exams are for us, it, the, all this falls at a good time for us each year because we're on the semesters, uh, uh, we're on semesters at, at uh, University of Florida, and so some of our guys are finished with exams already. And, you know, those teams out in the West Coast and the Ivies and all these people, they're, they're still grinding through tough stuff, you know, academically. And now we've got a little bit more time on our hands, and, you know, it's, it's just let's, let's get after this. And so, you know, we want to keep – fresh but we also want to keep sharp and I mean for me it's always been about competing and how do you get somebody competitively ready you got to compete you know can't just drill the whole time but there's specific things that we are working on with each guy so in the morning time we do our individual work in the afternoon we do more team and it's mainly competing in one one form or another and so for us even today we're we arrive on the bus uh, from Gainesville here to Athens today, and our courts are at 4.30. We were able to sneak out there at 4 o'clock and, and get a couple hours, and they were quality hours. I mean, no, no, I mean, I was impressed. It was one of our best practices on the road after a bus trip. So uh, that told me everything I needed to know how hungry these guys are because they got after each other today. There was some running on the line, and we're still running sprints, and we're still doing suicides, and you know, you lose, you, you know, winners move up, losers move down. You know the games, you know the drill, Bay. You know, you, you can't just play for nothing. So, so something's on the line, and, and we get after it, and we have fun, and there's a little banter back and forth, and the guys are giving it to one another, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's fun. But and then on Friday, all of a sudden, we get to we get go, go, go get after somebody else, and that's, that's even more fun. That's true, and that's my last question. LSU Mississippi State battle for the right to play you on Friday. How much do you actually, as a coach, get into draws, analyzing, scouting? How much do the players get into it? I know in juniors, I try to manage that a little bit because players can get a little lost and, and actually be defeated or too sort of complacent going into matches, if you will. I know my time out there with uh, Mike and Bob Bryan, they never wanted to know who they were playing. They just wanted to know who the first match was. They didn't want to see the draw. They say, Bay, don't tell me. You know, we'd go out, Macker would have a game plan, and we would just go and play. So everybody handles draws and draw talk differently. I'm just curious uh, how things are done in Gatorland. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think we, we have a team program, you know, but we've got a lot of individuals. And so, for instance, Sam Riffis, he wants, he wants all the details, you know, when we meet, we, we do a game plan meeting uh, with every single player and every doubles team before every match. And uh, Sam, Sam's already looked at video on his opponent. He knows who he's going to play. He's gone through it himself. And when we sit down those meetings, he breaks the other guy apart. I mean, he breaks him down. Like, I mean, just the guy likes to serve here. Uh, big points. I know I got to cover these things. Um, I know where I need to direct my return of serve. If I serve wide to this guy's forehand, he blocks at line. Uh, if I serve to the backhand, he's pulling across every time so I can serve and volley there. And he, he's going very specific and detailed through the stuff. Uh, whereas I got Andy Andrade, who's a field guy, and you start clouding this guy with any information and things can really go south in a hurry. So very little information, you know, go out there and compete like an animal <laughs> and go do your thing. And you know exactly what that means. And so for him, he's a field guy. He, he figures it out on the fly really easily. Um, but for some guys, it's, this, is, this is plan A. If this isn't working, we're, we shift to plan B because this guy can't handle pace through the middle. So you can always shift into that to start setting up your plays. So it just depends on which guy we're talking to, Bay. But uh, knowing your personnel and knowing how they respond to information, you're right. That's it's critical. And a little guy by the name of Roger Federer used to also check video of his players and get one step ahead, actually. And he didn't do so bad. Dennis <laughs> Vandermeer always told me 
that battling the mixture of conscious and unconscious as a coach and knowing how to give the right amount of feedback to different types of players is a real key part of coaching. So I, uh, I, I definitely agree with you there. And we like to thank you again for taking a minute from team meetings and dinner to sneak over and say hi to us here at Tennis One Out because clearly the Gators are one of the top teams in the nation. We want to wish you guys well and hopefully see you on our road to uh, Champaign in Champaign. Thanks, Bay. Uh, Madison, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me Thank on. Thank you so much, Coach Shelton. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. I know everyone here thoroughly enjoyed it, and good luck to you this weekend. And we hope, like Mark said, we hope to see you in Champaign. Sounds good. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much. And we'll kind of shift things over. Obviously, this is a college tennis show, so we're going to talk all things college tennis with our special analyst, Mark Bay. And we're going to get right into it. And Mark, I wanted to start things off. It's obviously a lot to unpack in college tennis. There's so much. You and I talked throughout the week about all of the different conferences, all of the different rules, so many upsets, here, everything going on. So I just wanted to start things off with what are some of the trends and themes that you've seen for college tennis this season? Yes, thanks, Madison. I would say still no different. Whoever does a great job with you know, no add points and doubles are going to win. So I think that theme stays consistent all the time. But above and beyond that, I'd say this year's Pac-12 has been wide open, very unpredictable, hard to guess what's going on. There's so many topsy-turvy results in the Pac-12 this year. I say Tobacco Row, men and women, a ton of top 25 programs on both men and women's side collectively you know, that little area with the Wakes and the Dukes and North Carolinas and North, North Carolina States, all these teams in the top 25. So that's one heck of a little area. I think that the Oklahoma women are no joke. Some people thought that the national indoor final was a fluke for them. They backed it up and run through the season, done an outstanding job. Uh, and I also think that a next player up, there's still some residual with COVID. And then obviously some other teams have had some challenges with injuries. And I think even look at the North Carolina Tar Heels on the women's side, losing all of the Davitellas and the Grams, and now this new you know, generation of, of Tar Heel women, next player up, whether it's COVID, whether it's an injury or people graduating, next player up. A lot of teams have done an outstanding job there. And I feel the NC State without having Alana Smith, I feel like Tennessee here down the stretch, missing Johannes Monday are still battling hard. Uh, Kentucky sometimes missing drag. So it's just been a lot of teams that have been missing some key pieces in the, in the wheel and still doing a good job of getting four points in other areas. And you touched on it a little bit there. A lot of hot teams coming in hot here at the end of the season. But who would you say on both the men's and women's side, who are the two hottest teams coming down the stretch that maybe were a little bit unexpected for you? Uh, well, Oklahoma women, 14 in a row. That's hot. Texas A&M women, 17 in a row. That's very hot. That's piping hot. So they're doing an outstanding job leading the, the, the charge and the torch in the SEC for the first time in their program's history. I think the Gator men, 15 in a row. And I think the Virginia men, after having a challenging beginning with a really tough strength of schedule, some people thought Coach Pedrozo packed it on too heavy in the early part of the season. But now here come the Wahoos or the Cavaliers, which name you prefer on a 14 in a row uh, match win streak. So a lot of great, uh, I think, strong power showings from these teams on the way down the stretch. And as far, there's a lot of upsets in college tennis. You've touched on it throughout the show so far. What has been the biggest overall surprise for you on either the men's or women's side that you've seen thus far? Yeah, there's some surprises. I, like Jimmy Borndame, shout out to Jimmy Borndame, a guy that played in the Super Excellence Program in Chicago, Middle, Middle Tennessee men. Uh, even though they just lost last weekend, 18 in the nation, amazing season, really close, but knocking on the door to host may be difficult now without more points in their conference tournament, but outstanding. Iowa State women uh, joining the Big 12 and coming from obscurity to top 35, I thought it was outstanding. Loyola Marymount, uh, West Coast Conference team underneath Pepperdine's wing and 22 in the, in the country with a win over UCLA earlier this year. Uh, how about UCSB? Shout out to Wayne Bryan, his old alma mater on the women's side, beating Stanford. Stanford is, is the pinnacle of, of tennis, uh, college tennis and championships and, and that tradition. So UCSB to be able to beat a big sister like Stanford in California match is unbelievable. I feel on the other side, 
there's been some challenges, some injuries and some things have, have cost a team like Illinois and a team like UCLA on the men's side are fighting for their lives just to try to scrape their way into the tournament at the end here, the bottom of the eighth inning. And uh, I'd say Kentucky and maybe LSU on the women's side in the SEC who are perennially been in the top uh, NCAA conversation, maybe not this year. So I'd say those are some of the bigger surprises this season. And, you know, from a coaching standpoint, when you're dealing with injuries like that and you're dealing with some adversity, what are you kind of telling your team to push them through and try to get them to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and get, get yourselves into the tournament? I think that as a college coach, you're, you're hopefully doing a great job of building all of the players in your lineup. You're, you're going to have some people unhappy because there's always a line at six. So those people that are seven should be dying and chomping at the bit to get in and prove themselves. And then when that opportunity comes, hopefully they take advantage of it. And I think some people have, but ultimately there is, uh, I think finding four points can come in all different types of beginnings and sizes from the doubles point to winning four singles in a row. You just have to have committed players that are out there fighting from first ball to last. Yeah, definitely. And we'll get into a little bit of the technical side here as far as rules go. Obviously, much different than pro tennis with there being teams, doubles and singles, of course. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the 500 rule. For those that don't know, can you just kind of explain how that rule works and if any teams are in jeopardy of missing the tournament due to the 500 rule? Yeah, the 500 rule is uh, the team actually has to have the same amount of wins and losses to be able to make it into the tournament as an at-large bid. If you actually win your conference tournament, you could be uh, having a possible losing record, win the conference tournament, and actually get to play. But it puts a ton of pressure on, on teams and players in that regard. And so I would say UCLA, who just this week, <laughs> this week, Put a couple double headers in there and they had a, uh, a losing record and now i think they're finally 12 and 11 right now going into the conference tournament so hopefully they're going to be okay if they can pick up some more wins and help themselves in the conference tournament but uh ucf which has been obviously a top 25 team coach john roddick plays a very difficult challenging schedule struggled a little bit with some new players and some injuries and uh obviously now they need to at, at eight and, or nine and 13 they need to run the table and win a very tough American conference that has a lot of strong teams in the top 40. So including SMU being a, a great team this year. So that's going to be very challenging for UCF because they'll have to win out. Uh, also, Princeton women still at this point, I think, having a losing record, but uh, with two more matches in the Ivy, there's no conference tournament for the Ivy. But I think if they went out and win both matches this coming weekend, that would put them 11 and 10. And similar to the situation with Virginia and some others, Coach Laura Granville put a really tough schedule out there. They played, they didn't lose to Cupcakes. They lost some of the best of the best teams. And then obviously they've been doing a pretty good job and the Ivies only losing the Yale, I think, this season. So uh, if they went out and win the Ivies, I think they still can make it even if they didn't have a losing record. But I think at nine and 10, I think they'd be 11 and 10. So yeah, UCF, UCLA, Princeton, some of those were sort of, uh, I think, flirting with some of that rule. Yeah, definitely. That rule obviously like you just said, flirting with some of these teams here. But another thing, historically, hosting meant being a top 16 seed and now means being a top 16 and top eight seed. Can you just elaborate on this rule and what it means for the sport on both the men's and women's side? Uh, yes, Madison. I've been going to the NCAA tournament since 1998. So I've been to every final since 1998. And... 1998, that was when the Bryan brothers and Stanford's team, arguably the best team in the history of college tennis, only lost three matches, not points, just just matches in an actual uh, entire season. So they didn't lose any matches to another team. So that was an amazing run in 98. And I've been to every single one. I've seen some of the most amazing results and finals. Here we're going back to Illinois. The last time we were in Illinois, Adrian Puget of UCLA hits a volley and he barely touches the net with his foot. Mitchell Frank misses the lob over his head. UCLA thinks they won a national title and the referee says his foot touched the net and we're going all over. It's, NCAAs has a lot of amazing drama. It's compelling. Last year with you know, Sun and Pascal Leva finishing that girls final was incredible theater. So I'm always looking forward to it. Was was really thankful to be part of the broadcast coverage and see that. I think now moving into this particular year, uh, how you can can host and be part of the actual tournament is that 
historically the, the final 16 teams would all go to the, to the championship site. That's no longer. So you get to the round of 16 now, you actually have to play that match on a home court for a university. So historically being a top 16 seed made you meant that you were probably going to host, could win two matches on your home courts and make it to the big dance. Now, to be a top 16 seed, you could maybe make it to the round of 16 and then now have to travel and play a, um, a round of 16 match against a higher seed there. So the, the key now is not just to be a top 16 seed, it's actually to be a top eight. So it's a race to be a top eight to possibly make it uh, all the way through on your home courts. It's still, even with the rankings, sometimes not even a safe bet. So last year, an interesting thing that happened was Texas A&M women were 10 in the nation, and they came to Chicago here. I watched the match. Um, they played Northwestern here, and Northwestern got to host. So the NCAA is trying to do their best to regionalize and make the first two rounds cheaper and cost-effective for the entire tournament, and then possibly realize that there may be some travel involved with that round of 16 match. So... Obviously, the teams are working really hard to get this number and get these seedings, and it's been a lot of concern all, all year, and there's a lot of discussion, but uh, we'll see it all come out in the bracketology and the ranking show what happens. But clearly now, having an actual you know, three-match homestand to be able to make the NCAA is very attractive, and that's why a lot of these top teams have scheduled the toughest schedules and fought their, their tails off to get in these positions, and it'll be interesting to see where that dividing line is where eight and nine and then we're 16 and, and, and not hosting is uh, when tournament time comes. Absolutely. And a lot of these conference tournaments beginning this week, but not all of them. So I wanted you to kind of just break down for us the conference rankings and how that is going to work as we head into this weekend. Sure. So starting with the Big 12, the Big 12 on the men's side, I, I'm looking at it like – how many top 25 teams do they have? How many potential NCAA berths? Who's the favorite? Some intriguing matchups and maybe who's on the bubble. That's how I looked at it as I was kind of framing this. And in the Big 12, they have three teams in the top 25 right now. It looks like possibly four NCAA berths. TCU's the favorite, but only a slight favorite. Clearly Baylor and TCU have gone back and forth here in recent weeks. Some of the compelling matchups would be maybe a Baylor Texas semi or a TCU Baylor for the third time in the final, and the bubble team would be Oklahoma for this particular conference. Absolutely. So moving on to the next conference for the men's side, uh, the Pac-12. The Pac-12. I, I've got to say, like I said at the, at the start, uh, three teams in the top 25, four possible NCAA bursts, Arizona question mark because Southern Cal now is ahead of them in the rankings again, the new ones that were just published this morning. Stanford USC semi would be really, really entertaining. And I think UCLA, who's done a heck of a job now at 46, climbing, trying to get themselves in the tournament, Oregon at 48, Cal at 50, all in the bubble. Definitely. And now we'll move on to the ACC conference for the men's side. ACC, very, very strong six teams in the top 25. We talked about that tobacco rule strength, nine possible NCAA bursts, Virginia, the slight favorite, NC and NC State. That's the match that I would be really interested in seeing what happens in that particular one. They had a really close one here recently. There's not a lot of teams on the bubble. These teams are pretty much in. This is just a bit, a bit of extra matches and bragging rights, I think, for these teams. And I love how Louisville has stepped up and put themselves in the top four of the conference. And that's an outstanding effort. And probably should have mentioned them in the early part of the show. And some of the teams that have done an excellent job this year. Yeah, so a lot to look forward to on the ACC. And we'll end it off for the men's side with the SEC. Well, SEC, as Brian said, Florida three, Tennessee five, South Carolina nine, Kentucky 10, Georgia 11. So that is monstrous. That is five in the top 11, folks. Six teams in the top 25, 10 possible NCAA bursts out of this conference, maybe more. Florida's a favorite going in, but as you know, Shelton said, Tennessee you know, clipped them last year, so anything's possible in these tournaments. I like to see this Kentucky-South Carolina matchup if it happens in the semis. That would be a really you know, entertaining popcorn match for me. And I, I think that Vandy and Arkansas are bubble teams at 49 and 51, where without a quality run, i.e. winning maybe three matches in the conference tournament, I don't think they'd be able to get over the hump. 
Yeah, a lot to look forward to in the SEC. So we'll end it off with the women's side of things, starting with the Pac-12 Conference for Women's Tennis, taking a look at this one now. Yeah, and the, and the Pac-12, excuse me, the, the Big 12. Oh, you, we're, Sorry, we're, Big we're, 12. We're, yeah, we're Big 12. So I, <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah, no worries. I have a lot of respect. I, I, I've known Audra Cohen for a long, long time, back when she was winning gold balls with Billy Clark. So I've known her. She is a tough girl, very competitive, did a great job here at Northwestern before going on to Miami and having a great career. She is all about getting the job done. And there was no way she was taking that job and being satisfied with just being a mediocre squad. And so with some names, Slee, Corley sisters, that there's some girls that, you know, maybe were fairly known names in juniors, but I, I can't say that these were the household names and the very tops of blue chip ratings. She's gone out there in Oklahoma and made a name very quickly. And like I said before, that second in national windows wasn't a fluke. They backed it up and done a great job in beating national champion Texas. And so Oklahoma is, is strong. Four teams in the top 25, six possible NCAA berths. Oklahoma, obviously, a slight favorite. And I'd like to see, actually, the Oklahoma State-Texas semi. I think that would be an interesting one. And, and at this conference, it's a small one, but the majority of them are, are doing quite well and are going to be in the tournament. Not a lot of bubble teams here for this conference. Yeah, you said it's small, but four teams in the top 25 can't beat that. So now we'll take a look at the Pac-12 Women's Conference. Pac-12, five teams in the top 25, potentially seven NCAA berths. Cal's the number one seed, but they've taken some losses during the course. So it's, it's uh, many people have said it. I think uh, Alex Gruskin on, on Crack Racket said he just needs to see more from UCLA. And UCLA, unfortunately, with injuries and COVID, could not make the North uh, California swing. So UCLA did not get a chance to play Stanford and Cal. So there's a lot of unknowns here relative to what's going to happen at this particular conference. But clearly, uh, I, I think that it'll all shake out in Ojai, and, and that's why they play the matches. But I'd love to see the USC-Arizona semifinal and possibly a UCLA-Stanford matchup if it happens. Uh, Arizona right now is a bubble team. And they're currently at 48 on the outside looking in and need to make a big splash here at Ojai. Absolutely. And we'll take a look at the final two, the ACC for women's side. ACC on the women's side. Beast, six teams in the top 25. The most of any conference on the women's side in the top 25. Eight possible NCAA bursts. North Carolina is still the favorite, even though they just lost to Duke. Duke has always been a very strong team, full of outstanding players that have a lot of confidence. Duke has, has sometimes been out of the conversation. I thought they caught their stride at the end of last year, and now here they are coming again with some new players like Emma Jackson and Ellie Coleman that are starting to get their, their feet wet and, and be able to match what Kelly Chen and Chloe Beck and some of the other ones are doing. So I think that the ACC tournament will, will be interesting. And I think Coach Calvis is... Sure, you never want to lose, right? But because he had this new team with a lot of unknowns, he's been running the table since the National Indoors. I don't think, sort of like what Shelton talked about with the volunteer loss, I don't think it's a bad loss for Carolina to take that loss to Duke. It may get them hungrier and keep them focused for this tournament. And I think uh, right away, Florida State-Notre Dame is a big match tomorrow. Talked to Coach Artisan about that today. I think a UNC and Virginia match would be an outstanding semi. And at this point, uh, Notre Dame is, is on the bubble. So they're going to need to step up at 42 and try to get another win or two to solidify themselves because that line has been about 43, 44. Because what happens here, Madison, is that there are 30 conferences on the men's side and 31 conferences on the women's side. So it's trying to get – you don't know what the other – teams and schools are going to do. And if they're upsets in the conference tournament, that hurts all the at-large teams that are on the bubble. So if I'm an at-large bubble team, I most certainly want the favorites to come through in these conference tournaments. Definitely. And I don't think, yeah, that's not a lot that people normally think about is that you want the bubble team to do that. Uh, so let's take a look at the final conference, the SEC for women. Four teams in the top 25, Texas A&M, again, running the table. Outstanding job this year in the SEC. 17 matches in a row. I was at the National Indoors. I just went to, to say hi to Mikey Cation and Gruskin, who were calling and get ready to call myself in Seattle for the men. And I was hanging out with Coach Weaver, and I watched the girls that were singing and dancing and doing TikToks and having fun. And I, I said, well, Coach Weaver, what's this team like? And he said, Mark, I got to tell you, 
I am really impressed with how good. I think we're really, really good. You just never know till the balls go in the air, but I, I feel really good about this team. He really looked me in the eye and had a strong conviction. Now, I did jinx him, and they lost to Cal that day. But I got to say, they haven't lost since. They run the table, and now they're six in the nation. And I, I'd love to see you know what this team does with a mixture of the, the veterans like a Goldsmith and some of the transfers like a Brandstein, and then somebody like Macarova, who at two has never lost and is probably the best two in the nation on the women's side. Absolutely. So I feel that, uh, they're, they're the favorite. I'd love to see a Bama and Tennessee match early on because Alabama and Ole Miss are on the bubble. Uh, and I think that uh, down in Gainesville, well, it'd be interesting to see what, what Coach Shelton's wife does. Is she going to go over to Athens or is she going to stay home to watch Emma? Because now Emma is going to be playing for the Gators and, and, and playing at home. So that, that's a wonderful, um, I think, recap of all the major conferences. I will say this, the American Conference which I am commentating with a little plug this weekend on ESPN Plus, that conference is very strong. The American Conference has, uh, American Athletic Conference is, is on the men's side, has SMU as the top team, but they have UCF, USF, Memphis, Tulsa, a lot of good teams that are gonna be fighting and battling to get into the tournament. And on the women's side, uh, UCF is probably clearly the favorite at 19 in the nation. But SMU with Coach Jeff Navolo and then Tulsa, who's the home host, it's in Tulsa, are going to be battling possibly. So an SMU-Tulsa match could be pivotal in terms of making the tournament out of that. And, and the American Athletic Conference has had four or five teams in recent years, and they deserve the same type of respect and credit um, that some of the Power Five have had. So for all the conference tournaments that are going on this weekend, that, that's sort of a summary there. There's a little bit more going on, though, Madison, uh, because there's unfortunately not – just one conference weekend. It has been over two weekends for many, many years. The majority now with the new format, the majority of conferences have shifted to this early date block that we're on this weekend, but there are a few conferences that are still gonna be up for grabs and the Atlantic 10 will still be contested, a few others, but the Big 10 uh, will still be, uh, are still playing regular season matches right now. And so the Big 10 will be playing their conference tournaments the women playing in Iowa and the men playing in Wisconsin coming up on the following weekend. And so just like in the NCAA shows where you're waiting for that last game and then they can make their decisions or the committee can make the decision, often that's the, that's the case. So last year I was calling Illinois versus Ohio State, the Big Ten men's final with a dramatic win for Illinois, 4-3 in a four-hour match. That was the last match that created a whole bunch of extra seeding changes and, and um situations that, that created the final draw for the tournament. So the Big Ten uh, is the last Power Five conference that probably should be mentioned. And on the women's side, Ohio State's done an outstanding job, some veteran leadership with Boulay and Coley Allen, and obviously some newcomers like Ratliff and Sian Cantos is outstanding. So I think that Coach Melissa Schaub has done the best job she can do. Unfortunately, the conference just isn't as deep as it needs to be with the quality wins. So Ohio State was in the top 10. Seven, eight, a lot, a lot of the season, and now they're they're down to ten. It'll be hard to get into that top eight, which is sort of the ideal place to be. But Ohio State at ten, Michigan women at twenty three, Northwestern women now at thirty nine on the bubble with a loss to Illinois last weekend, Wisconsin at forty five on the bubble, and, and a really strong team in Illinois after beating Northwestern at forty seven. So you've got some bubble teams now for sure. Ohio State, and Michigan are in the dance, and you never know. Maybe Michigan could get to host if there's some strategic uh, regionalization that has to go on with the draw. But the Big Ten is, is obviously a strong conference and historically is a little bit stronger. I think that the bottom has come up to meet the top, but I think that the top's a little bit, you know, off of where it has been in recent. But uh, last but not least, uh, on the men's side of, of the Big Ten, Ohio State Buckeyes, Ty Tucker came in and just destroyed everybody in the beginning of the season and just you know, had one loss to TCU at the National Indoor in 4-3 dramatic fashion. And then Michigan ended up beating them for love at Michigan. And then with a little bit of a, I think, attitude adjustment as the lineup switches, uh, now the Buckeyes, you know, got the Wolverines back. So who knows, a potential round three of Buckeyes in, in Michigan could be amazing for a uh, Big Ten final if that happened this year. And uh, Northwestern has been a really strong team and they're 28. And shout out to Arvid Swan and, and the great job that he's done there. And Illinois men who were pretty much going to be out of the conversation, defeated Northwestern last Sunday. So both Illinois at home defeat both Northwesterns to give both Illinois teams that were outside a chance and trying to make this last push 
here in the last few matches and, and the conference tournament to make it in. So I think that sort of sums things up from where it stands, going through all the different conferences and, and some of the storylines that have happened this year. I think it's safe to say that was a lot to unpack. There's so much in college tennis that we are so excited to follow along. And Mark, we thank you so much for kind of breaking it down, simplifying it for those of us who may not be as familiar with college tennis. We're super excited to be a part of this unique and exciting coverage here in the Tennis One app. And next week, we talked a lot about it this show, bubble teams. That's going to be the focus of next week's episode. We're going to really go in depth for all the teams on the bubble. So we thank you all for joining us on this edition of Road to Champagne. Mark, thank you so much for talking us through it and, and providing the insights that we couldn't get anywhere else. So we appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for bringing and elevating the conversation. And we'll catch you back next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, same time here in the Tennis One app.